O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You discern my thoughts from far away. Even before, before a word is on my tongue, tongue O oh Lord, you, you know, know it completely. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. How many are your thoughts, O oh God? I try to count them. They are more than the sand. Let us worship God. Welcome, and welcome on this cool, crisp, but sunny morning. We're glad to have you here at worship at First Presbyterian Church. Uh, let's see if we have any new folks out here this morning. Well, if you are new here, we're glad you're here. And if you would leave a card in the visitors, a visitor card in the offering plate, we would appreciate it. Um, 
not a whole lot of announcements for this week. Uh, I think that the world is freezing up, so uh, it's a light schedule. The prayer group will meet on Tuesday at 4 p.m. Uh, please come and join in praying for our church and our community. Uh, there will be, and this is near and dear to my heart, a men's breakfast on Saturday, January 20th. Also a little lower in my stomach, too, come to think of it. Uh, all men are, to invite, are invited to join at 8 a.m. on Saturday. Wednesday night should be fun. Uh, there will be a soup cook-off for our fellowship meal. Uh, and uh, bring your best soup, and we'll figure out who's got the best soup there. There are details on the um, cook-off, including an entry form that you will find in your bulletin. And there are some other messages on the bulletin, so be sure and read that document front and back. So, is there any other information that needs to be shared at this time? Hearing none, let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. Actually, between there and here, I did think of something else. Uh, and that is uh, about the prayer group. We have a wonderful prayer group that meets on Tuesdays. We get together for 45 minutes or so, and we pray. We pray for our church. We pray for our na We pray for whatever it is that we um, feel com called to pray for, including praying for your prayers that you turn in on the yellow prayer slips. We share these, and uh, we pray. But we could use some more prayer, prayers, and if you're able, from 4 to 445 on Tuesday, um, come join us. We meet in the chapel. We have a good time. We do chat and visit as well, and uh, we need you uh, to pray for our church. That is what we as Christians are called to do, and so let us do it together. Um, David didn't mention that this afternoon the session and diaconate will meet at 5 o'clock for our annual joint meeting. Um, somewhere in the Book of Order requires that we have lasagna. So we will be obeying the Book of Order and having lasagna. Let us continue our worship. Let us approach God now with confidence, trusting in God's grace as we humbly confess our sins together. Let us pray. Lord of new life, as people of faith, we struggle each day to write by you, but we confess that too often we veer onto the wrong path. You call us to follow you, but we choose to sin against you as we defile ourselves. We misuse our bodies as we foul our souls. Forgive us our sins. Help us to bend the course of our faith back toward you. Help us to bring glory to you in every moment of our lives. Amen. Our assurance of pardon. The steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Indeed, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let's sing. Jesus Christ is truly the peace of our lives. He has reconciled us to God in one body and one spirit through his sacrifice on the cross. May all we do, we do in his holy name. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you.
Please join with me in our prayer for illumination. Let us pray together. Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing me may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our reading today comes to us from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 6. Um, on Wednesday nights, uh, after dinner, we hold a Bible study, and this Bible study always focuses on the passage that's coming up for Sunday. So last week, last Wednesday, we looked at this passage, um, and I recorded it, and I hope to do this in the future and have posted it on our church's website in the sermon library section. I put a notice in the newsletter. So if you miss the Wednesday supper and would like to get a jump on Sunday's sermon, I invite you to go to the website and listen to the, um, listen to the Bible study. Oddly enough, the Bible study is longer than the sermon. I don't know, 20 minutes. <laughs> but in this one in particular, there was a lot of ground to cover. So let us hear these words of the Apostle Paul. All things are lawful for me but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her. For it is said, the two shall become one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. This is the word of the Lord.
invite the younger folks to come forward, please.
A rather odd story hit the national news right before the end of the year. You may have seen it. It had to do with a university president. Specifically, he was a chancellor of that university who was fired from his job after it became public that he and his wife, who was also a professor at the university, had produced and starred in several adult videos. These videos were their hobby, because everybody needs a hobby, apparently. Uh, they made these videos themselves, they paid for them themselves, and then they posted them to the internet. And when word of these films became known, the Board of Regents of the State University System met and immediately, immediately terminated this man from his job as chancellor, a job he had held for 16 years. Now, the man objected to being fired, and he argued that he had done nothing wrong and that the school was infringing upon his freedom of expression. Now, to be fair, the chancellor had done nothing illegal. He didn't break any laws. And the videos make no mention of the school where he worked. There was no connection between the two. And on the other hand, to be clear, the school did not impinge upon his freedom of expression because he is still quite free to express himself in this way or any other way. He just can't do it as chancellor of a university. The school does not have to condone this action. Now, the school took the right step in dismissing this man because as chancellor, he's the face of the university, and as such, He's responsible to represent the ideals and virtues of that institution. In their statement about the firing, the Board of Regents said the ex-chancellor had shown a reckless disregard for the role he was entrusted with to serve students, faculty, and staff, and the campus community. As a parent, I certainly want, wouldn't want my child going to some school where this man was in charge, and I can't imagine that any of you would either. And so, it was at this point, as I was watching this news broadcast, that I was reminded of one of my favorite sayings. This is one of little truisms that I keep tucked in my head, and it goes like this. Just because you can doesn't mean that you should. And I say this a lot, usually to myself in my car when someone flies past me weaving in and out of traffic. Yes, you may be able to drive like that, but is it really the right thing to do? That chancellor and his wife, well, were they free to make and post these adult videos? Absolutely they were. Was it the smart thing to do? Eh, probably not. I mean, just because you can doesn't mean that you should. Now, I tell you this story this morning because it almost perfectly illustrates our reading from 1 Corinthians. And not because Paul is talking about fornication and sexual immorality, but because Paul is talking about freedom here. The chancellor would argue that he should be free to do whatever he wants, to express himself however he wishes. But as Paul argues, freedom comes with responsibility. Now, during Paul's time, the Greek city of Corinth was a large, bustling metropolis. It was a major center of trade and commerce. In 44 BC, a century before Paul's visit, Julius Caesar had designated Corinth as a Roman colony. 
And colonization meant an influx of inhabitants from all over the Roman world, as well as a wonderful influx of wealth. Paul came to Corinth as a missionary around the year 50 AD. And he stayed there for 18 months, building up a worshiping community of Christian believers from the diverse population of the city. And once he was confident that the church was strong enough to stand on its own without his leadership, he then moved on to his next mission opportunity. This was his pattern throughout his missionary life. But as was his custom, Paul kept in contact with his former parish, and it was not very long before he received word that there were significant points of conflict growing within the congregation. And so in response to this conflict, he wrote letters back to the congregation with his words of teaching, guidance, encouragement, and love. Today, I am starting a five-week series called Faith Refracted, Confronting Corinthians in the Season of Epiphany. Now, Epiphany is a time we're in right now. It's a time on the church calendar that begins on the day of Epiphany. Anybody know what date that is? January 6th, yes also known as 12th day of Christmas. Yes, January 6th, Epiphany, 12th day of Christmas. The word Epiphany is Greek, and it means manifestation. And the Bible story that we associate with Epiphany is the visit of the wise men. These are the first non-Jews to pay homage to the Christ child. And the divinity of Christ is made manifest with them. I'll be talking about this a lot more in the future weeks. The season of Epiphany begins on January 6th and it ends with Lent. And during this season this year, I will be preaching from the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. As I mentioned, this letter to the church in Corinth addresses a number of issues that were plaguing that congregation. Issues such as members of the church, suing one another, the practice of idolatry, chaos in worship, the role of women in the church, the inequality that was found at church fellowship meals, and more. As one scholar put it, the church in Corinth was, quote, <laughs> a hot mess. Our reading for today centers on a word, and that word is porneia. Porneia is a Greek word that means sexual immorality, fornication, or debauchery. And Paul uses this word throughout our reading, but when he does, he's specifically referring to the practice of men visiting prostitutes. Now, this does not appear to be an issue with the members of the congregation in Corinth. I mean, because if it were, Paul likely would have called out the offenders by name. That's what Paul liked to do. But it is, however, an issue within the broader Roman culture. And it was not uncommon, and it was even accepted for men to consort with prostitutes. But Paul is using porneia to differentiate his congregation from the general population. As one scholar writes, in the first century, any respectable Jew would have condemned porneia. This was a sin of the Gentiles, precisely what the Jews did not do. Porneia was a dividing line between Jews and Gentiles. And Paul makes this clear when he writes, shun porneia, run from porneia, and keep running. Because porneia is a sin that the followers of Christ should steer clear of. 
engaging in this behavior makes them look like the pagans in their society. As Paul writes in Romans, Christians need to be in the world without belonging to the world. Engaging in pornea would place them in the world of the pagans and therefore on the wrong side of their faith. So if this pornea, this fornication or sexual immorality, is not in fact a problem with the Corinth church, then why is Paul telling the people to reject it? Because, because he's using this subject to make a greater point about our relationship with God. Our reading for today begins with this statement. All things are lawful to me. Another way to say that would be, I've got the right to do anything I want. Now these words, they appear to be a common catchphrase among the members of the Corinthian church, which Paul is quoting back at them here. Now when he was with them, Paul taught that in Christ, yes, they have freedom, a new freedom. But some members of the church, it appears, some have taken this to an extreme with the belief that, well, they're free to do anything because now they are with Christ. And when they are with Christ, the rules of the world no longer apply to them. They also have incorporated the Greek idea that the spirit is everything and that the body is nothing. The body will die, but the spirit will live forever. And if that is the case, then who cares what the body does? The body can engage in pornea, but it doesn't matter because it is the spirit that is important. That was the belief. Now, this idea has evolved within the congregation, believing that in Christ they have the freedom to live as they wish. In other words, all things are lawful to me. They are new beings. The world is behind them. They exist now on a spiritual plane, therefore they can do anything. But Paul says no. Paul counters this belief saying, yes, you may do anything, but not everything is the best for you. In other words, just because you can doesn't mean that you should. And then he goes on to explain to them that their bodies are not meaningless. You are human beings. You have bodies. You are created this way. Your bodies are central to you and to your relationship with God. God made your spirit and God made your body. Your body is a temple to God and you should treat it as such. And by temple, Paul doesn't mean that they are to lift weights until they've carved out a physique like Adonis. No, he means that they are to conduct themselves as if their body is home to God. Treat your body as if it were a temple. Treat it like a church. And here today, because we are in fact a church, we are very careful about who we allow to use our building. Because the people in our building sends a message to the community about who we are and what we support. We proudly allow recovery groups and compassionate hands to use our building because these are things that we believe in. But not everybody should be using this building. For example, Wanna, I'd like to tell a story here. A number of years ago, a person that I had met through my involvement in the community asked me if two friends of his could get married in our church sanctuary. As a favor to this man, I said yes and arranged to meet with this couple. They showed up, but they were accompanied by a pastor 
they wanted to participate in the service along with me. Now, this young couple was lovely. I enjoyed getting to know them. But I had an odd feeling about the pastor they had brought with them. And so when they left, I went online and looked him up and discovered, quite to my surprise, that he was an active white nationalist and the head of an organization promoting Southern secession. I went to the session and advised them to permit the wedding, but to prohibit the involvement of this particular pastor. Because we didn't want anyone to think that our church, this church, in any way supported those ideals. When I informed the couple that we, that we would not allow the pastor to participate, they chose to be married somewhere else, and that was probably for the best. In the same way that our church is a temple, we should also treat our bodies as temples to the Lord. And as we walk around town, we are to be little FPCs in the flesh. As Paul writes, the body is meant for the Lord. It is not meant for those things that detract from the Lord. We are to run away from porneia, for that is an abuse of our relationship with God. Instead, make your body a temple of the Holy Spirit. In all that you do, make sure that you reflect the presence of God in your life to the world. So that as people see you, they know who you are and who God is. Finally, Paul writes to the Corinthians saying, These bodies of yours, they belong to God. And your bodies are holy because they were created by God. And yes, you may die, but... In the end, there will be a bodily resurrection, just as Jesus Christ was resurrected. And this bodily resurrection is not free. It comes at a cost, the cost of the price of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Jesus gave his body so that we might live. Jesus' body was holy, our bodies are holy. Jesus gave his body for us. If we were to say that our bodies are worthless, then we are denouncing the sacrifice of Christ. Your body was bought with a price. And because of that sacrifice, Paul tells the Corinthians that their job is therefore to glorify God in all ways, even with their bodies, even especially with their bodies. As we read this passage, it's difficult not to get sidetracked by Paul's talk of sexual immorality. But the overarching purpose of Paul's letter is to focus our attention on the fact that our lives begin with Christ. Paul writes in this letter that our lives were bought with his sacrifice. <coughs> in Christ, we find freedom, freedom from sin, freedom from death. But in Christ, we also find that we now belong to God, body and spirit. We live not for our own sakes, but for the sake of God's holy purposes. Our many, our individual body, it's not mine. It's God's. It's God's creation to be used for God's purposes. The body of Christ, which is what we call the church, the body of Christ is not ours. It is God's creation to be used for God's purpose. So let us remember this in all that we do. Let us remember that although we are free in Christ, we are also bound to God to serve God's will. 
We serve God with our spirits. We serve God with our bodies. And our divine purpose is to glorify God with our bodies and to be walking reminders to the world of God's presence. This is what we're called to do, to love God with our heart and our mind and our strength and to glorify God with our whole selves. Amen. standing and affirm what we believe. Today we will use words from the Presbyterian Brief Statement of Faith, which is in your bulletin. Let us confess together. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female of every race and people, to live as one community. But we rebel against God. We hide from our Creator, ignoring God's commands. We violate the image of God in others and ourselves, accept lies as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation. Yet God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation. In everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant, like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child. Like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. Please be seated. Let us pray. Almighty God, our offerings are only a portion of all that you have given us. 
we gratefully present these gifts and entrust them to your work in the world. May our gifts share the good news of the gospel to those who are in need. May these gifts help unburden those with the heaviest of loads. Amen. Your offering will now be taken. For our prayer together, I will begin with some intercessions, and as I say, Lord, in your mercy, I ask that you respond, hear our prayer, and then I will ask for your prayers of concern, that we might share them together. Let us pray. God of the resurrection, we praise you for always searching us out for knowing us so intimately, and for being acquainted with all our ways. We acknowledge our sinfulness 
And we ask you to guide us in the way of everlasting. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you, O Lord, for our relationship with the Compassionate Hands Ministry and its mission to provide not just shelter, but love to the unhoused people in our community. And as we gather in the grip of winter, we pray for those who are out living on the streets. Lord, in your mercy. Holy God, we lift up to you those who have been killed, injured, or displaced because of human violence, especially those in Ukraine, Israel, and Palestine. Comfort the survivors. Strengthen those who treat the injured and provide the necessary humanitarian aid to help them all. We pray, not just for an end of violence, but we pray for an enduring peace among all peoples. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Holy God, we pray for our government and our leaders. We pray for the president and the governor, as well as those at county and community levels. We pray that you will give them the wisdom as they face the challenges of leadership. Lord, in your mercy. Holy God, pour out your healing power on the spirits, the minds, and the bodies of all those who are in pain or sorrow. And we pray especially those whose names are foremost in our hearts, our friends, our family, the members of this congregation. Friends, what are your prayers this day? Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Check it, keep out. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Jack's daughter, Jennifer Browdy. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Lynn Custer Pratt. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Cheryl Jones. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Holy God, may all those who suffer live in joy and peace and good health. And we pray that you will give skill and patience to all caregivers and family members and friends. May we all pray for the well-being of those we love and those we don't. Lord, in your mercy. And let us continue praying with the words that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
I pray that you will all keep warm this week and be safe. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace both this day and forevermore. And all the people said,